Sorry for the confusion and let's get started. I really want to thank you all for spending part of your Sunday with us. My name is Nancy Sheldon and I'm honored to represent and want to thank our Santa Barbara Path to Victory team, which includes Michelle Cutler, Marilyn Chuck Zagar, John Lewis and Carrie Tobes, Zach and Allie Tobes, Dorothy Largay, Jill Finston, Deborah David, Ann Daniel, James Eagleton, Beryl Kreisel, Susan Rose, and my husband, Mike, for working to make this next hour one that we believe will be informative and will provide you all with a roadmap of how we can do so much more than cast our votes. And I'd also like to acknowledge Anthony Mercurio, Senior Advisor to Pete Buttigieg, and Heather Smith, a consultant and former CEO of Rock the Boat, Boat, who's been fighting for the right to vote for decades. Without their support behind the scenes, we wouldn't be here. So the Path to Victory team has been working on this election season to support Democrats up and down the ballot, especially in races for the Senate and for the presidency. With an excruciating 65 days left until the election, we want to ensure this good work is not in vain. We need to protect our rights and make sure everybody has an opportunity to vote and that every vote is counted. And even though this particular fight, it's been going on since our democracy started, but it feels different because this time it feels like this, this election is where our democracy could end. But our goal today is not to increase anxiety or try not to. We need to understand the issues, where our vulnerabilities lie and how we can most effectively deploy resources. So tonight, Pete Buttigieg, Mark Elias, and Lauren Growargo are gonna help us do that. You're Mark Elias so, and Perkins, right? I have had the pleasure of introducing Pete Buttigieg several times in the past year, and it will never get old, even as I age and he clearly doesn't. Pete, we are lucky to have you, not only still in the fight, but continuing to lead the fight. The fight for our families, our livelihoods, our planet, currently for our decency and for our lives. And you have talked a lot about what's at stake and how complicated this election season is. So I'd like for you to set the stage, but first I have a question. Do you know who said this? The vote is precious. It's the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democratic society. We must use it. Do you know who said that quote? You put me on the spot. I've heard John Lewis say something uh, like that. Uh, in fact, I remember the very last day of our campaign. He came, it happened to be the day of the March in Selma, and he addressed us with words to that effect. So uh, if that isn't John Lewis, it certainly sounds like him. You got it. There you go. <laughs> well, uh, uh, this is definitely a, a gathering, I think, in the spirit of what John Lewis put, uh, stood for and fought for. So thank you for that. And, and thank you, Nancy, for, for your friendship and for your leadership. Uh, it's difficult to believe it's about a year since we met in Santa Barbara. Uh, I, uh, um, in the context of the pandemic, Santa Barbara is very close to the top of the list of places in my campaign. I made a mental note saying, as soon as I can come back under quieter circumstances, I want to be back here in a hurry. And sadly, it hasn't happened yet. But uh, then again, the other side of the coin is a national convening like what you have brought together that we're part of right now that might not have been possible otherwise. And so uh, I'm, I'm thankful for you uh, bringing this together. I'm thankful for your friendship and support during my own campaign. I know there are a lot of people on this call who are a big part of my effort. Uh, and no matter where you were in that uh, nominating contest and who you were backing, I'm so glad we're on the team, same team right now because uh, we've come to a crossroads where, or a cliff. We're running out of cliches, to be honest. Uh, no cliche and no uh, hyperbole can really adequately capture the moment we're at. If you'd asked me when I was running for president in January, February of this same year hmm. to be ready for the stakes to go up dramatically, I would have looked at you funny, wondering how that is possible uh, from where we were, where we knew we were at the beginning of this year. And yet here we are. And as we wake up to disturbing news today, as we have woken up to disturbing days, uh, news more days than not, one of the things I keep thinking about is... Uh, some of the moments in, in my life, whether in the military or even as a student, when uh, I, I was uh, called on to assess the state of development of countries that were going through terrible situations. And when you look at things like uh, a challenge in fighting widespread disease, a deep economic depression, 
or the emergence of political violence. Th these are the indicators that a country, any country, is in trouble. So this is not exaggeration to say that we are at one of the most precarious moments that our country's ever faced, certainly the most in our lifetime. Uh, you know, a lot of the issues that we talked about uh, uh, even a year ago were not necessarily sexy at the time, deep issues of democratic structure and reform, uh, but they've always been important. And now they've become what they rarely are, which is important and urgent at the same time. And that's why I'm really honored uh, to be on this call with leaders you're going to hear from in a moment who are uh, literally uh, among the very top people in the country uh, working to make sure that we have free, fair elections in November. Uh, we know what's on the line in terms of our values. We know what's on the line in terms of the policies that need to change in this country. We know that we have the opportunity uh, to not only uh, move past the dark chapter that we have now, but get leadership whose first instincts have to do with healing and not dividing. But it's become increasingly clear that something more serious is at stake, which is the character and perhaps even the survival of our democracy itself. Uh, we have been reminded all the way back to when Ben Franklin uh, was asked uh, uh, what kind of government we were going to get and told uh, the onlooker it was going to be a republic if you can keep it. We've been reminded that democracy is an activity that has to continue, that we have to shore it up, that we have to defend it. And that's true right now. Now, we're in a bit of a trick bag in the sense that we have to do everything we can right now to ensure the integrity of the elections and to beat back voter suppression. And at the same time, we also have to make sure that our activity and our vocabulary does not make the mistake of playing into the hands of those from foreign adversaries to the president himself who have an interest in delegitimizing our system. Uh, look, we should already be bracing. And don't get me wrong, we are not getting ahead of ourselves uh, in the 60 some days that we need to uh, be on top of from a campaign perspective. But we've got to be bracing for what happens next. The president has already said that if either he wins or the election was rigged, that's an astounding thing for any president to say, let alone an unpopular president who's losing as we speak. What that means is that we need to shore up the legitimacy and the integrity of our elections. And the best way to do that is to make sure on the front end that we've done everything in our power to see to it that they are beyond reproach. And that's something all of you on this call can do something about. You probably wouldn't be here if you hadn't already done a great deal to support candidates who share our values uh, or are connected to those who do that day in and day out. And that is incredibly important. And it's what I concern the bulk of my time with doing myself. But there's something more right now, uh, something that, again, is usually one of these sort of procedural unsexy things kind of bubbling in the background that right now has to be front and center, especially if you've already made your decisions and your commitments in terms of the individual candidates that you're backing. And that's making sure our democracy is in good shape. Here's some things that you can do specifically about that. One, overlooked, uh, but I think incredibly important, is to sign up to be a poll worker or urge people to do the same. I'm going to come to all the nefarious pressures against our democracy in a moment. But one of the reasons why there are fewer polling places than there need to be in a lot of places is the simple fact that uh, we don't always remember this, but elections in this country are largely run by volunteers. And those volunteers are usually retirees, the very people who have all kinds of uh, uh, pressure and reason not to participate this time. My generation hasn't generally thought of themselves as uh, signing up to be poll workers. It's just not quite as, as, uh, as common. But we've got to make sure that we're urging as many people as are able to participate and, and be part of that simple way of contributing to your democracy. Now, you take off your campaign and partisan hat at the door when you do it. Uh, but it is really meaningful public service. Another thing is to talk to everybody you knew, you know, about the importance of beating back voter suppression and shoring up uh, the integrity of our democracy. Uh, that is, uh, again, something that uh, you may be used to talking to everybody, you know, talking about the candidates you believe in, raising a sense of urgency about the campaigns. Now we've got to do the same thing about the mechanics of the elections themselves, with your social media platforms, with your uh, networks. Make sure that you're doing that. And in particular, look, most of us probably know just about everybody in our world has, has decided how they're going to vote. Not everybody's decided whether they're going to vote, especially uh, those who could make the difference in so many of these uh, crucial states and, and communities. And that's an area where everyone here can make an impact. 
The third that's critically important is to support organizations that concern themselves with the integrity of elections. It's something that's very important for uh, Win the Era. Uh, there is a PAC and also a 501c4, the Win the Era Action Fund uh, that we launched after my presidential campaign came to an end. Partly uh, doing work supporting candidates we believe in, but partly raising our voices around issues that we care about. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we know where every candidate stands on the issues of democracy itself. It is as important this time around to know where a, a candidate stands on issues of voter suppression as it is to know where they stand on health care, climate change, taxes, and all the other issues we usually grill them about. We've got, we're going to hear from two other incredible organizations leaders tonight. One of them, uh, Fair Fight Action, uh, which is uh, another ally of, of Win the Era and uh, an ally of all those. Uh, who are uh, seeking to have their voice heard. They raise the alarm in state after state and make sure people know their rights in our strange American patchwork of systems where decisions are being made even yet now uh, over how exactly the elections are gonna take place this year. And then there's democracy docket. Uh, and in a moment, I'll introduce you uh, to uh, uh, Mark Elias, an extraordinary leader, uh, pursuing among other things, the legal work that needs to happen fighting state by state, court battle by court battle to make sure there is as much integrity and as little suppression as possible going into the polls. Uh, I don't wanna take much more time away from them because again, their extraordinary work and their deep expertise uh, should command most of the time on this call. And I'm really interested uh, to learn what they've said to respond to the questions that you've been raising. But I wanna mention one other thing that's really important. We need to be preparing ourselves, each other and the public for a scenario where we don't get the answers on election night. Now, uh, I think it's safe to say after my experience in Iowa that nobody knows more than I do the impatience of wanting to get results the day of the vote. And it's something we as Americans are very much accustomed to. It is likely that that will not happen in many key states and in many key elections this time around. And that in and of itself is not necessarily a sign that something has gone wrong. In fact, with off the charts levels of vote by mail expected, and some states, depending on which state uh, you're in, and Lauren and Mark will know them down to, the, uh, down to the precinct. I don't recall them off the top of my head, but there are many states where they're not even allowed to touch or open the absentee ballots until the in-person polls have closed, making it virtually impossible that they would all be counted within those 24 hours. So we got to get ready for that. We've also got to beat back against the vocabulary that someone won on election day, and then it got away from them in the absentee ballots coming in, as if one part of the election counts more than the other. There's only one election. Each vote is as valid as another. Some of them are gonna happen in person and some of them are gonna come in by mail. So we've gotta pay a lot of attention to our vocabulary and prepare one another for this experience where we're gonna to have to hold onto the sides of, of the raft for uh, quite, uh, uh, quite some time, hours going into days after election day and not allow that to be used as uh, fodder for undermining the legitimacy uh, of elections where good people win even while on the front end, uh, we need to make sure that when that election day comes, every one of us can say, I did everything I could, supporting, volunteering, and yes, uh, contributing uh, to those organizations, doing what it takes in order to ensure the integrity of the election and prevent uh, voter suppression in any form. So that's why I wanted to make sure to have just a little bit of time uh, to encourage you in your efforts, to thank you for coming together uh, and to, to be part of this program. And with that, uh, I am go going to turn it over to uh, uh, an extraordinary legal mind. And again, somebody uh, who is very much on the forefront of the legal battles that are securing the vote. Uh, Mark Elias is somebody with all of you and a tremendous honor to, to um, be here uh, with uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who was an extraordinary um, uh, leader of our party, is an extraordinary leader of our party, um, and who is, you know, they sometimes say that uh, after, after the um, 2012 convention, people said that uh, Bill Clinton was the explainer in chief. There are times I think that actually Pete Buttigieg is actually the explainer in chief. Uh, he takes uh, complex issues and I think does a oftentimes a better job of explaining them than uh, than uh, than anyone else. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, as as the mayor said, you know my um, 
my uh, background in this is as a lawyer. Um, I've represented Democratic candidates and causes, political parties, progressive uh, organizations for my entire political career. I was Hillary Clinton's general counsel uh, in the 2016 campaign. And um, I realized shortly after uh, that was that that election that Donald Trump was going to be a, a corrosive effect on democracy like we've never seen before. Um, he remember even before he was sworn in uh, in an election in which he won, he was claiming that there were three million illegal votes cast in California, and that's why he didn't win the popular vote. He set up a fraudulent vote commission that was a mockery and went nowhere. But it was clear that he was going to erode democratic norms democratic institutions, and ultimately that would come around at the time of his election to, uh, to eroding the, the institutions that we count on um, to hold elections. Um, the thing about Donald Trump, though, is that he actually, for as much lying as he does, um, he also uh, has these moments of clarity in which um, he tells the truth. Um, and he's been very, very clear about what he intends to do this November. Um, in January, I wrote an article uh, on my website um, uh, that talked about the epidemic of uncounted ballots in America. The fact is we've had an epidemic of uncounted ballots in America going back years and years. My background, unlike most voting rights lawyers, uh, my background is actually as a recount lawyer. So most voting rights lawyers start at the front end with voter registration and then move towards election day. I, I've always started at post-election and moved towards election day. And what happens when you do that, what you realize is that we, ha we have an epidemic of uncounted ballots in America. Every election, people go get the illusion of democracy. They do everything right, and yet their vote doesn't count. And the, 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 pop, the, the group that is most affected by that are people who vote by mail, vote absentee. Absentee ballots have a rejection rate in normal elections between one and one and a half percent. In-person rejection rates are minusculely small, um, but when you dig into that one to one and a half percent, what you find is some really alarming things. So, for example, in Florida, where there was a very close uh, Senate race between um, Senator Nelson and, uh, and Rick Scott, Senator Nelson, the Democrat, lost by one tenth of a percent. Andrew Gillum in the governor's race lost by four tenths of one percent. What, what you found upon, ref upon review, looking back at, at the rejected mail ballots there, was that if you were over the age of 65, the chances of your ballot being rejected were 0.6 of, 0.6 of a percent, six tenths of 1% of ballots cast by those over 65 were rejected. If you were 18 to 21, your rejection rate was 5.4%. So you had a one in 20 chance of having your ballot tossed out if you were young and only a one in 200 chance in having it tossed out if you were old. What if you were black or Hispanic? You had twice, actually more than twice the chance of having your ballot thrown out than if you were white. That's in 2018. That's before we got to Trump's reelection, COVID, and the crisis that we're now facing. So I started bringing litigation. In March, I wrote an article also on my website, Democracy Docket. I wrote an article called The Four Pillars to Protect Voting Rights with Vote by Mail. And there were four things that I identified that every state needed to do in order to make sure that we flatten the curve of rejection so that we don't see these wild rates of rejections and that we see we don't see disparate treatment of people based on age, based on race, and based on gender. And yes, by the way, I mentioned gender because out of a study in Georgia, we learned that women have a higher rate of rejection than men. Now think about that for a second. What are the chances that women, in fact, cast more fraudulent votes than men? The answer is none. The reason why women face a higher rate of rejection has to do with the practice of signature matching ballots and the fact that women oftentimes change their name when they get married, and therefore someone who registers as Deborah David, uh, becomes married and becomes Deborah, uh, Deborah Jones, and then signs their name Deborah Jones when in fact it no longer matches their, their voter registration. So um, I identified those four things and we started litigating. And we started litigating before COVID because even before COVID we knew this was gonna be a problem. With COVID and the increase of vote by mail ballots, um, this has now become a true crisis. Um, and so we've been litigating around the country to try to strike down laws, whether it's witness requirement laws or some of these uneven counting laws, to make sure that we don't see disenfranchisement in the fall. Now, what has the Trump campaign said for its part? The deputy campaign manager said, quote, the president, in, in the president's view, I'm sorry, quote, the president views vote by mail as a threat to his election. Okay, that's what he said. He said it on 60 Minutes. Go look at the tape. 
Um, there was an AP report that said that, uh, quote, deep pocket and offered anonymous donors are pouring over $100 million into an intensifying dispute about whether it should be easier to vote by mail if I could determine the president's uh, fate this November. Okay, $100 million. The RNC announced for its part, it's going to spend $20 million in court. In fact, you can go look online. There's a video that Rona McDaniel, the, the RNC chairwoman did on Friday saying they're spending $20 million in court because, and they are in 41, they have, they have 41 lawsuits um, that they are currently litigating because they view the expansion of vote by mail and the leveling of the playing field as a threat to Trump's reelection. But most importantly, what did Donald Trump say about this? Donald Trump gave an interview in which he said, quote, my biggest risk is that we don't win lawsuits. We have many lawsuits going all over. And if we don't win those lawsuits, I think, I think it puts the election at risk. So my job is to make sure he doesn't win those lawsuits. So we at Democracy Doctor, we've been, we're, we've litigated, um, we've, well, this cycle we filed 67 lawsuits. Right now we're currently litigating 35 of them. Um, there will be additional litigation uh, uh, in the coming days and weeks. In fact, I will tell you tomorrow, you will see additional law, uh, litigation filed by us. Um, some of these cases are filed on behalf of Democratic Party organizations, but the majority of them are filed on behalf of individual voters or 501c3 and 501c4 organizations that are simply trying to vindicate the right to vote. There is everywhere I go, I, people say, well, what, are, you know, what about what the Republicans want? I say the Republicans don't want anything. They're suing against drop boxes in Pennsylvania. They're suing against in-person polling locations um, in, in, uh, in Nevada. They're suing about automatic voter uh, 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 ballots being sent out in New Jersey. They're suing about absentee ballot applications going out with people's names pre-printed in so that people don't have to fill in their own name in Iowa. And they're trying to throw out 50,000 uh, absentee ballot applications that have already been returned. So the fact is, there's no aspect of voting that Donald Trump wants to succeed. His entire campaign is premised on the idea that if fewer people vote, and in particular, fewer black, brown, and young people vote, and fewer people in cities vote, he's going to win re-election. He doesn't have a strategy to win re-election if turnout is between 50 and 58 percent, which is what it has been bookended for the last 30 years. He has a strategy to win if turnout is in the high 40s or the low 40s. And that's what he's playing for. And he has assembled a, a team of lawyers who are going state by state bringing these cases. He has assembled, he is assembling a 50,000 person uh, army of people to go to polls and challenge people, something we have not seen in 40 years. Uh, in 1981, the RNC ran a voter challenge program in New Jersey. Um, Roger Stone was involved in organizing it. And as a result of that, they were under a 40-year ban by a federal court from being able to run that program again. It was a racist program that had off-duty police officers wearing black armbands um, and targeting Hispanic um, uh, and African-American neighborhoods. If you Google uh, RNC um, consent decree or RNC uh, ballot security program, you will see the signs that they had posted in black and brown neighborhoods that said, uh, that warned people against voting um, and the penalties for fraud. So my piece of this equation is to where we need to go to court to fix these things, I do it. But thankfully I have a partner in crime or a partner in justice as I like to think of it, um, in Lauren Girl Wargo. Uh, Lauren runs an organization called Fair Fight 2020, which many of you will know because you'll say, oh, that's Stacey Abrams organization. And yes, it is Stacey Abrams organization and Stacey Abrams has endorsed the four pillars that I mentioned and she, and, and, and it does a phenomenal job. But the real mastermind behind this organization is Lauren. And Lauren and I talk every day um, because Lauren is building the opposition to what she refers to, and she deserves all the credit for this phrase, the, um, the Trump uh, voter suppression war machine. There is in fact a Trump voter suppression war machine and people who ask me what I am doing about it, I say, call Lauren, <laughs> because Lauren is the one who is countering that war machine where there are litigation solutions that are necessary, she comes to me. Where there are not litigation solutions necessary, I work with her and she, she plays the lead. So people who ask me, you know, how does my work intersect with Fair Fight and Lauren? It is entirely synergistic. Um, we work arm in arm and there is no better partner in this fight than Lauren. And let me just end by saying that whenever I think of Lauren and the work that she does, and every day, 
getting up and first in the in the in Abrams gubernatorial uh, campaign and then in, in the post gubernatorial era, uh, era with all of the misogyny and hate and racism that spewed at her and at Stacey Abrams. I, rem I am reminded of a quote from Justice Scalia, someone who I was not a fan of, but who wrote in a case out of Washington State about ballot initiatives. He said, requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. Lauren Grow Wargo is the embodiment of that quote. She stands up in the public square and every day um, stands for, for what democracy is about and engages in that civ civic courage. So I can have no better partner in all of these things and I could not be prouder to introduce anyone and recommend more strongly that you listen to and hang on every word than Lauren Grow Wargo. Lauren? Thank you so much, Mark. And um, it is such a joy to work with Mark Elias. My joke is, Mark is not my lawyer. I, I actually use a different law firm. <laughs> and Mark and I have a consensual strategic partnership uh, between our work and our organizations that serves as some real unique connective tissue for the Democratic Party and progressive ecosystem in this very unique moment. I first wanted to shout out to Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete, I'm actually from Cuyahoga County and at my parents' home to get some help with childcare right now. And you have so many fans, especially in this region. I live in Atlanta um, and just so grateful that I actually am older than somebody who ran for president. So that is just a thrilling thing. You are just such an inspiration um, and so proud that you're from uh, the industrial Midwest. So, and thank you, Nancy, and to the host committee and everybody for being here. I know there is just so much anxiety. Um, Mark and I are getting it every day from supporters and candidates and elected officials at every single level. This is really hard. And so I just want everybody to take literally a deep breath and remember this is a fight. And it's not just the 65 days until election. As Mayor Pete reminded us, this is going to go on for some time. There's 106 days until mid-December when states and their electors meet. And so if any of you, and I know we've got some Abrams for Governor supporters on this call, recall that 10 days that we were fighting to count every vote. That's going to be more similar to what we're going into. And this is a fight for our very democracy and this the fundamental right to vote. So it's not going to be simple. It's going to continue to feel uncomfortable. And just like the Postal Service crisis, I think, has shown everybody, there are going to be more anticipated and unanticipated crises that the Trump regime is going to cause. And so we're barely just getting started in what this fall is going to be. It's going to be messy and it's going to be difficult. I'm not here to tell you otherwise. But what I am going to tell you is what my dear friend Stacy and I talk about all the time. And her phrase, you may have heard her say it, is when we fight, we win. And the Republicans have weaponized that against us because they like to remind states that she's not governor of Georgia. But what she means by that is something very specific, which is that when we take the fight to them, be it in the courtroom or in the streets or in a fight for a good piece of legislation or even just standing up and using our platforms, we are having an impact. We have incremental or big change that we see in our policies we change the conversation. And I think that's what we have to remember in this moment in our democracy and going into this election is that this is a game of fighting and it's a game of mitigation. We do not have enough power to stop everything they are doing at the local, state, or national level. We have to think strategically and we have to put up a fight. We have to fight for every vote. And so as Mark said, there's sort of three things we think about in terms of voter suppression. First, you have to be able to register and stay on, stay on the rolls. Those are two different things, both registering and staying on the rolls because of the way voter purchase work in many states. Second um, is having access to the ballot, right? Being able to get to the ballot, be it a mail ballot, a ballot early, in person or on election day. There is a whole architecture of suppression around that, consolidating precincts, uh, making it hard to get an absentee ballot at your home. And then the third is whether or not your vote counts, getting your vote counted. And that's where a lot of Mark's litigation is focused, is to ensure that folks' votes actually count. 
and we have a discriminatory system in many states around signature matching that blocks way too many African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans from their right to get their vote counted. And so many people don't even know that then their vote doesn't get counted. So we have to be thinking about those three pieces holistically. And one, one sort of reminder that I wanna use is this recent USPS crisis. Every crisis along the way, we need to take it from a lens of understanding that there's a massive architecture around suppression on every method of voting at a level we've never seen before. So we can't throw out any one method of voting. We can't say, oh no, postal service is under attack, vote by mail must be out, we have to tell people to vote in person. No, we have to make sure we do voter education and voter suppression mitigation. And I'll talk about what that looks like for mail voting. And remember that the architecture they have built is going to be long lines, intimidation, a whole set of things around early voting. There's not gonna be any one way that isn't thwarted by this apparatus. So I dubbed what the other side has been building since the consent decree that Mark talked about expired, it expired in 2018. The Trump administ administration has been putting together through the Trump administration, where they control in Congress, the Trump campaign, the RNC, all of the Republican national committees and their outside groups, groups that have been around for a little bit that you might recognize like Project Veritas and True the Vote and some newer groups that are just rehashing the same figures on selections projects and others. What they started doing when that consent decree expired, they started it really when Trump was inaugurated, but really started going to hyperdrive when the RNC was freed up from this court order that said they could not participate in this ballot security. They built out this proliferation of groups. They call it literally a coordination loop where they're all architecting out using lawyer, a uh, legal network and a financial network to do litigation, policy, intimidation, and federal abuse of power. And it looks a whole bunch of different ways to make it harder to vote, to suppress and depress the vote on the front end, and then to minimize the number of ballots that get counted and challenge the counting. And so this piece has been building for some time. As I like to say, th these folks have gotten information. And so, our side of the aisle, progressives and Democrats, we have so many great voting rights groups. We have a lot of great efforts going on, but it really honestly, until COVID hit, our movement really, that's when we got in better formation. And what Fair Fight really started to do in that really fraught, difficult time was started to think about how can our ecosystem start to coordinate and share information and work together in a legal and compliant way at a level that our side has never seen. And so we talked to smart lawyers like Mark and many others to say, what is the information sharing we can do? Because what's really unique about the right to vote and election administration and voter suppression, it's an area we can all talk to each other. And so we have been convening major 501c4s, political committees, independent expenditure committees, and others to share information and really push forward how we can collectively combat this threat. And it's through a couple different ways. One, it's voter education. We need to do more voter education than we've ever done before. And then voter suppression mitigation, which looks like lawsuits, it looks like elections administration advocacy, it looks like policy, and it looks like a whole bunch of hand-to-hand -hand combat in polling locations. And so that's what we have all been building out. As Mark said, Fair Fight 2020, we started almost exactly a year ago. We moved about $4 million into 18 state democratic parties to start funding voter protection staff early. Thank goodness we did that with our partners and allies because then once COVID hit, those staff were there. And now the Biden team, as they're building out their coordinated campaigns, they have all of that staff in place as they scale up their operation. And so we'll keep going into the question portion of it, but you can sign up to get involved at fairfight2020.org. I saw some of the chats coming through and we'll push out information to you on how to get involved as a poll worker, as Mayor Pete said, and how to get involved in big D democratic and progressive voter protection opportunities in the fall. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Nancy, to start the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Lauren and Mark. I don't know whether to be inspired or still completely freaked out. Um, so I'm gonna start with, we had a lot of questions on the USPS and um, I know you referred to it, but there have been a lot of people saying, this is not a partisan attack on the postal service. It's equally 
Dem it's equally going to hurt Democrats and Republicans. So why should we be worried when, you know, it was Republicans in the first place that wanted to do vote by mail and this is going to hurt them? Why should we worry about it? So let me take a shot at it this way. Um, number one, just as a matter of data, historically, you're right. There is no benefit to one party that would vote by mail. There was also no benefit historically to drop boxes between one side or the other or pre-populated um, absentee ballot application forms or for that matter, absentee ballot application forms at all. None of these things had any provable partisan effect in the past, but that's all changed because understanding Donald Trump's agenda here or motive here is to understand that he simply wants to make voting harder generally because he needs to take down participation rates. He can't have there be a 58% voter participation rate like there was um, uh, in 2012. He can't, he can't, he can't tolerate a 54% or 56% uh, rate like there was in 2016. So he needs to get participation rate down overall, number one. Number two, um, there are uh, partisan differences in the effects of some of the changes he's making around the Postal Service. So the fact is Democrats tend to live in more highly populated central areas. So when you slow down the central sorting machines, you impact more densely populated high volume areas relative to less densely populated areas, simply because in less densely populated areas, you don't need as much high speed equipment to sort mail because it's, 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 it's not, you know, it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not as important, number one. Number two, um, is some of you may have read in either the New York Times or in um, the Atlantic articles that refer to what is referred to as the late blue wave. Um, this is a phenomenon that has been going on for some time now, which is that in general, Democratic voters and constituencies tend to vote their absentee ballots later, and um, Republicans and uh, constituencies tend to vote their absentee ballots earlier. So, you know, basically the older Older, whiter voters tend to vote their absentee ballots as soon as they get them. Younger voters and voters of color tend to vote their absentee ballots later in the process. So when you add days to the mail, when you slow down the mail, you actually wind up disqualifying more Democratic ballots than Republican ballots because those ballots wind up being late received. So there is a there is a partisan impact. There is a reason why he's attracting attacking drop boxes. There is a reason why he's attacking the postal service because in 2020 it will have a partisan impact. Okay, um, Lauren, uh, I have a question for you about the NBA. You know that they just came out and they announced a plan to use arenas as election polling places, and it was part of their deal. You've worked a lot with um, getting people of color to come out and vote. Is this going to move the needle? And if it's not, what will? And and how can we increase turnout it, like you have? And I know you've had tons of success in Georgia. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the um, most motivational, um, I don't want to even say things, one of the, one of what's motivating new voters, infrequent voters, um, sort of sporadic voters overall, is the fight for racial justice. So we have recently come back with research in the field um, with African-American, Latino, Asian-American, and young white progressive, new or infrequent voters. So not super voters, regular voters every single year. And uh, across uh, race and age in those cohorts, the fight for racial justice that is so moved this country and been in the streets in this country this year is the number one reason people wanna vote. And you're seeing that in the NBA. We partner with more than a vote which is LeBron James's organization that works with NBA players. We work with a lot of the coaches as well directly. And I was just talking yesterday with LeBron's advisor and he was saying, it's exactly the case with the NBA. This fight for racial justice and equity and against police brutality and is really motivating folks to get involved. Obviously everybody wants Trump out, but I think we're seeing this movement. And then when you pair that with the stadiums, so right here in Atlanta, we had our stadium. They did they did their first test in a run a, a low turnout run out runoff in August just to try and see how it went and it went really well. So there's complexities to this because of the way you got to get in line and the different, there's some election administration challenges to it, but overall it's an absolute net positive for a whole variety of reasons. There are many folks in Atlanta, in Detroit, in Cleveland who haven't been able to afford a ticket and get in that stadium, 
right? Mm-hmm. They're going to get to go to that stadium and they're going to be able to be so inspired by these players and their family that are just making the case for justice in the this country nobody else can and so i think it's motivational i think it's going to be incredibly interesting for folks to be able to go into some of these stadiums i you know and i also think for the election administration side the election administrators we talk to are thrilled to be able to have big parking lots and be able to have the space and of course these teams are taking a really thoughtful approach they're not just doing this really rapidly at the end they're really working it through with their local elections administrators and how they're going to do this and make sure they can enfranchise the most people possible so we are thrilled like everything it's complicated and there's a lot of work behind the scenes um, but we think all of the messaging and just the empowerment and the opportunity is really fantastic and especially when you look at what's driving the folks the folks who are most targeted by this voter suppression war machine are the folks where this messaging and this availability is going to really tie together i think to be a really positive message okay so so two more questions on this one is is this taking place in swing states Yes, absolutely. This is happening. We were talking with folks in Michigan about this This is going to happen in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Ohio. Absolutely. This is happening almost across the NBA with the news that has come out this weekend. And so we work, we partner with groups like the Voting Rights Lab and Center for Secure and Modern Election. And they've been some of the groups behind the scenes that have been working with election administrators and the stadiums. But we're going to see this in battleground states and we're going to see it increase out and be incredibly helpful. Part of what's going on on USPS is that Democrats really are interested in voting by mail, but they have a lot of questions. And so really making sure that we have in-person voting opportunities where people can move quickly through lines because lines are the top most potent voter suppressive tactic because people lose time. They don't, it, it's essentially a poll tax when you have to wait in line all day. And so using these stadiums to, but you got to do it in partnership. That's why they're taking a really thoughtful approach through nonpartisan effort to really make sure they can do this in a way that gets the machines and the personnel needed so that this can be a net positive to the community to really bring down lines and enfranchise voters. So we have that tool, but how um, are we holding uh, state election offices feet to the fire and making sure that we they are uh, providing election polling places because we saw in Wisconsin they went from 180 I think it was to five in the city of Milwaukee how can that be possible how is that legal are we fighting that legally and and what can we do to help our statewide I guess election offices it, whether it be funding or something else I guess Mark yeah, Mark is absolutely fighting this on, on the legal front. So if you want to take a first stab. I'll, I'll just say we are suing uh, Wisconsin. We sued Wisconsin over the primary. Uh, you're right. They closed uh, all but five polling places in Milwaukee. Um, uh, that was not true statewide. Statewide, 15% of polling locations closed. In Milwaukee, it was virtually all of them. Um, we, we also sued in Wisconsin in the primary to have ballots that are postmarked by election day count, even if they're received afterwards. So some states require ballots to be received by election day. Some states only require them to be postmarked by election day. Moving states to to only require postmarked instead of received by is critical to our democracy. It is critical to our democracy. This is how we know. In in, In the Wisconsin litigation, the one issue we prevailed on was that. The result was that 80,000 votes counted that would have not counted. Mm. 80,000 in a primary election would have been thrown in the garbage as late received if we had not won that relief. And so we continue to litigate for the general election. We're waiting eagerly every minute of every day. I'm awaiting a court ruling in, uh, uh, in Wisconsin to see what the judge says uh, for, um, uh, for, uh, for November, but you should expect that that case, like so many of these, will wind up you know, going off the courts. So, Lauren. Yeah, so the litigation is key. And the other piece is, there's an unbelievable amount of advocacy that is going on. And I actually think the Wisconsin example, though the, um, well, the Wisconsin example, I think is helpful from this front. The Republicans really tested what they had there in April. And we saw the images of folks in long lines, people contracted COVID. It was a horrible, painful election that should not have been run in that way. But through really aggressive litigation that Mark was running, that the teams we had trained in Wisconsin helped provide the documentation to file that lawsuit. So it was really an example of the voter protection team on the ground in Wisconsin working in concert with Mark to get that litigation filed. The Republicans appealed, if you remember that, in April. They appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court the night before the election. 
Mark got that really key piece of relief around giving the extra time for ballots to come in. And there was an all hands on deck voter education effort that went on. And it was an awful, painful, horrible, no good election. But through the suppression mitigation work, a voter protection team on the ground in the Democratic Party, with Mark's work, with the governor doing what he can and learning along the way, the Democratic governor, um, and the voter education of the groups, we were able to win a state Supreme Court race that the Republicans so desperately wanted to win. It's actually the analogy I use for what the fall is going to be like in a lot of ways. It's not. It's going to take time to count votes. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be awful, and it's unjust for Americans. But through the combination of mitigation and voter education, we can get the electoral outcome we need. And then when we get on the other side of this, we can really use hopefully our federal power to really fix and clean up election administration in this country. So that's how I think a lot about that piece. And to your point, Nancy, we're going to see precinct consolidation. We're going to see that there's going to be an early vote location where somebody's going to test positive for COVID and they're going to shut that center down. The way that we're working on it now, I was just so glad Mayor Pete brought up poll workers. That's the number one most important thing is that we do get poll workers in these locations. And so there's powerthepolls.org is the main nonpartisan but progressive aligned poll worker apparatus that will hook folks up with their local jurisdictions. And no matter where you live, I know we have a lot of Californians, you need a lot of poll workers in California, right? So you gotta do it where you live. And so it has to be a true nationwide effort. But in the top 12 battleground states, Fair Fight Action, our 501c4 and our allies are all hands on deck on poll workers. And then the next piece is fighting this intimidation network that Mark referenced around the intimidation of poll watchers that the other side is doing. Part of the reason the president himself is going after mail balloting is this false notion of voter fraud undergirds the entire Republican strategy. It's a short-term strategy and a long-term strategy. They want to police the vote. Right, that's why they have this intimidation network. They wanna move people out of vote by mail into long lines and in-person voting where they have their observers. That's the name of the game. They want long lines and they wanna be able to sort of quote, police the vote. And so we're gonna make sure that the democratic and progressive side has tons of supports in place for voters who are in those lines. Um, but at the same time, the main most important message is be a poll worker. Number two, make your plan now to vote early by mail or in person. Pretty much every, every battleground state right now, almost every single one of them, you can be requesting your mail ballot for the fall now. You can do it online or you do it by mail, depends on the state. So you can request that vote by mail ballot now and then get it and return it right away. And if you don't want to vote by mail or can't vote by mail, like North Carolina, for example, you have to have a witness sign it. Maybe you live alone. There are some impediments to that in certain states then make a plan today to vote early in person. What does that mean? Look at your calendar. Look at when the early vote date starts. Plan to take an afternoon off or plan your childcare accordingly. So it's really all hands on deck. You'll notice for in the Democratic convention, on the convention to what President Obama has been tweeting on social media, the message is make the plan now to vote early by mail or in person. And then the voter education efforts can really support folks. And then the voter protection efforts can be asking those, helping people ask questions along the way. And if their ballots get rejected for a signature mismatch, or somebody has an issue at a polling location in the first week of early voting, all those problems when they happen early, the voter protection teams can really support folks to get, get it straightened out and get their vote counted. So the name of the game is vote early. Okay, so um, we did have a lot of questions about um, how to become a poll worker and um, volunteering there, but I just want to put a pin in this one. Are you allowed to go to another state to be a poll worker? And if not, are there other things you can do in another state? Because I think we're less concerned about what's going to happen in California than we are in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Michigan. Yeah, in, in nearly every state, you need to either live in the state or even locality to be the poll worker. First, don't sell yourself short. You have a lot of very important congressional races in California, okay? So <laughs> we've got a lot of DCCC, I, but I hear you, Nancy. It's, it's a fair point. The piece that folks can either travel or do remotely is voter protection volunteering. You can get involved with the Biden campaign to do you know, sort of normal text messaging and phone calls to voters, make sure they know. You can also do voter protection remotely. There's a national hotline that the DNC maintains that they with the Biden team will be staffing up. You can get trained to be a hotline volunteer. You can do that remotely from any state. You can do all kinds of remote volunteering around voter protection. And if you're willing to travel, there will be opportunities. So there's sort of two kinds of poll watchers. There's the folks that you hear about the Republicans all the time, the 50,000. 
those are people on the inside of locations. And those are usually most states, you have to be from that locality to become credentialed and be a poll watcher on the inside. But there's plenty of folks that we'll need on the outside, helping people who are standing in line, passing out water, answering questions. And those folks can be from across the country. And so if you do sign up to volunteer at fairfight2020.org, we'll make sure that you will get pipelined into the Big D Democratic efforts and the Biden campaign and others to do that sort of um, work if you're able and willing to travel. Okay. What if you're a lawyer? We, Suzanne Yang, I know she's asked this question. She wants to know if you're a lawyer, are there things that, that you, we can do or they can do to help you guys specifically from a legal perspective? Mark. <laughs> sure. Sure. So look, the, there is going to be an endless need for people to work um, voter protection and lawyers have a unique obligation and a unique skill set. It's not, they're not the only ones who can do it because as Lauren said, uh, there are lots of opportunities, but for people who, who, um, who are lawyers who want to figure out how they can plug in to, to bring their skills to the table around voter protection, you can sign up at Fair Fight. They, they are recruiting lawyers. You can sign up at the DNC. They're recruiting lawyers. There's an organization that I founded several years ago called We the Action, which only accepts lawyers. Um, uh, and there's a, a program that they have. Um, around uh, 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 election protection. All of these are feeding lawyers into the same basic pool. So Power of the Polls, you'll also hear various organizations are providing links to Power of the Polls, um, but the goal, is, um, uh, the goal is that we are going to need to recruit an enormous number of lawyers and non-lawyers alike. So whether it's Fair Fight Action, whether it's the DNC, whether it's We the Action, um, those are all fine. You can also, you know, uh, my website, democracydocket.com, you can sign up there um, and we will be, um, uh, A, you'll get information about voting rights and, and uh, uh, things that are going on around voter suppression and, and content that may be helpful to you. We will also be um, uh, funneling the people who we get through that site into these other programs as well. Um, uh, where people want that opportunity, we'll, we'll make sure. So you can go to Democracy Docket and sign up. Um, uh, again, that's, I, I would sign up at Democracy Docket more because you want to get the information around what's happening around the court fights. Mm -hmm. um, I would sign up either with the action if you're a lawyer or a fair fight 2020. Okay, I'd like just to back up for a sec as well and go back to voter intimidation because there were protections that voters had that um, were lost in 2018. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how Trump is taking advantage of that and what we are doing legally to fight um, this action by him. I mean, it's, it, I think it's causing all of us lots of anxiety. Yeah, so there's, there's two things to, to realize. The first is that in 1981, as I mentioned, there was a close governor's race in New Jersey that led to a racist voter suppression program run by the Republican National Committee. This led to a consent decree. You will sometimes, those of you involved in democratic politics, will hear the term about the consent decree. The consent decree they are talking about is a consent decree that was entered whereby the RNC would agree no longer to engage in voter suppression, poll watching, um, and other ballot security um, measures. That consent decree expired um, uh, after the last election. So when people, when I say to people, we are going to see something we have never seen before. I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally, because the RNC could not have organized five, no less 50,000 poll watchers uh, uh, under the consent decree. And in fact, they didn't. So, uh, so pre in previous cycles, they relied on this sort of ragtag group of outside organizations like True the Vote, but the RNC itself couldn't operate as a hub for that. So when Lauren described the coordination effort that they're, that they're engaged in, the key piece of that is the RNC and the Trump campaign. So we're gonna see something like we've never seen before because legally they're able to. But the second thing is, we're gonna see a, a voter suppression operation like we've never seen before because Donald Trump is shameless and he has drained every last ounce of shame out of the Republican Party. So like you just wouldn't have the party of George Bush. I worked for John Kerry to defeat George Bush. I hated George Bush. I worked for Barack Obama. We represented Barack Obama against Mitt Romney. But you would never imagine those Republican parties engaged in open hostility to voting. 
they might have had private hostility to voting, right? They weren't saints, believe me, but they would not have engaged in the kind of open hostility to voting we are now seeing. And so, you know, Donald Trump is not whispering the quiet part out loud. He is shouting the quiet part out loud. When he says that these lawsuits are the difference between him winning or losing, it's because he means that these lawsuits are the difference between winning or losing. Whether or not he can ban drop boxes in Pennsylvania will be the, can be a difference between whether voters vote, are able to vote by absentee or not and have them counted, particularly where you have mail centers being, uh, sorting equipment being ripped out of mail centers in Philadelphia. So the litigation is very important. There will be additional litigation, like I said, in coming days. We are looking very carefully. We are, along with Fair Fight, at the voter suppression operations they are running. In 2016, I sued uh, Roger Stone, True the Vote, and the Trump campaign under the Ku Klux Klan Act to try to uh, disrupt their voter suppression operation against Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, uh, and it's going to be worse. Um, uh, and we're going to use every legal tool available. You know, what can you all do? A, you know, sign up at Fair Fight, sign up at Democracy Docket. It's helpful for us to be able to get the word out. If you go to democracydocket.com, you can sign up and you'll, you'll at least know what we're doing. And, you know, for people who are able to make financial contributions, you know, the other side has, the RNC is spending $20 million. The other side's dark money groups are spending $100 million. They are in 41 cases um, around the country. Um, and so for people who want to provide financial support, you know, giving to either the 501c3 or 501c4, the Democracy Target Legal Fund or Action Fund are useful. If you want to make a contribution, go on the website and make a contribution there. Okay, so we have time just for one more question. It was going to be, what are the three things we can do? But you just told us what are the five things we can do. And we really appreciate that. But for the both of you, um, leave us with something inspirational you both are seeing as you take on this fight and um, give us that little flower in the, in the mud. I have a, an analogy of finding a little flower. Give us a flower that we can take with us over the next 65 sure. days. So I'll, I'll go first and just say that, you know, what I said about Lauren, I, I say about all of you. Um, now is the time to have civic courage. You know, um, I, 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 I will not take credit for, for anything that Kamala Harris has ever said, but I talked to Kamala, I, I represented Kamala Harris for many years and talked to her when, before she was running for president um, about the need in this time, at this moment in history, for everyone to sacrifice and do everything they can do to defeat this guy. Because without, if we don't do that, we will lose our democracy. I, I'm not gonna say that Kamala Harris wrote the end of her, her speech to reflect my conversation with her, uh, but, but you heard her echo those same sentiments. So I have hope. I think we're gonna win. I think, we're, I think this national nightmare is gonna come to an end, but it's gonna require the kind of civic courage that day in, day out, when we are having bad days, we are still fighting. When we are having good days, we are still fighting. We don't let the highs get too high. We don't let the lows get too low. And, you know, one of my inspirations in politics, and I realize this will be perhaps a mixed bag to people, is Hillary Clinton. And every day Hillary Clinton woke up, and no matter what they said about her, no matter what they were criticizing her for, she got out there and she fought. And I see in Lauren Girl Wargo and in Fair Fight that same spirit that no matter what they throw at Stacey Abrams, no matter what they say, they're out there fighting. And I like to think that's what I'm doing. And I think that if we all do that, if everyone on this call is just committed to every day between now and November, registering everyone they know to vote, telling people that what Donald Trump is saying is not okay, and fighting every day to hold our democracy, then I think we're going to win. I think it's going to be messy. I think it's going to be ugly. I think it's going to not be decided on election night because, as Mayor Pete said, there are going to be ballots that are counted. But I'm optimistic about the outcome. I, my only pessimism comes is if people just get too scared. They just get scared because they don't want to be targeted by their friends. They don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be criticized. They don't want to. In you know, I'm fortunate. I'm a 51 year old um, white man. Um, you know, I get hate, but not nearly the kinds of hate that Stacey Abrams gets, not nearly the kinds of hate that's, that Lauren Grow Wargo gets. 
And but we can't let that keep us from fighting every day. And so I draw inspiration from people like Hillary Clinton, like Kamala Harris, like Stacey Abrams, like Lauren Gorgo, because I know if they can fight every day, I can fight every day. Like it's easier for me to do it than them. And so that's my hope and inspiration. My hopeful piece is that this is, it is so clear when you talk to voters that they understand what's going on. And I think the overreach that they are doing when they're gonna start prosecuting people for voter fraud in states, that's something we didn't talk about, it's coming. And how are we gonna fight that? We're gonna fight that to the no, we're gonna defend voters, right? Like never before. And I think what's going to happen is they unfurl this strategy in the coming weeks the backlash is going to be so severe. Coming in this context, people know what's coming and they're going to vote. And I think we've got a ticket that understands this. I think we've got lawyers and advocates like Mark who understand it. And I think when we fight for our people and with our people and this network that we're all building, that's what it's about. We're not gonna, we're not gonna let these guys get away with it. And so I, I just see the seeds of the backlash in historic turnout. You know, we saw that in June in Georgia. We out Democrats outvoted Republicans. We had eight hour lines, some of the worst in the country. We outvoted them. Like our folks are are coming. And so I just believe that this ick and this evil, it's so clearly evil. And it's just not coded or or hidden. And so Americans do not want their right to vote to be taken away by a Trumpian conspiracy. When you talk to people about that, they are very aware that's what's going on. They're very aware that this is a right they maybe weren't sure they were gonna use, but now that they understand there are all these people trying to prevent them from using that right, the American pushback spirit is right there. And so that's why making sure we have our lawyers lined up, our activists lined up, and we're all doing our part. And it and our part means like don't parrot misinformation, don't retweet the president, right? We need to just be smarter and better about how we are in this knife fight, and then we're gonna make it through. And so I, that's what gives me a lot of hope, Nancy, and to everybody, is that we have so many great people in this fight, and voters understand what's at stake, and they have just gone way too far this time. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us and. You know, that's just the beginning of it. I want to thank you for everything you do every day for all of us. You are both getting up every morning and seeing what you can do to give people the right to vote. And I cannot tell you how much all of us appreciate it. Um, we need you in our lives and we are going to support you as well. So as you've discussed, the Republican strategy, it's to distract, con confuse, and sow distrust. So that's gonna. That's led most of us to take this whack-a-mole approach that we need to change, and you've made that clear tonight. So with that in mind, we've created a voter toolkit, which you'll receive right after this event, and it will focus on the things that we can do together and the organizations such, that, such like the two of yours that have been the most effective. So the best thing you can do, and I'm gonna say it again, and the most direct way to make a difference is to give and to give generously and to give as if your life depends on it, because as we've learned tonight, it does. And also donate your time and energy to getting the word out about what you've learned today. Tell your friends not just to vote, but to vote early and to you can track your vote as well. Help at polling places on election day if possible and recruit everyone you know to get into this fight. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being here and especially to Lauren and Mark. Uh, take care and be well. Good night, everyone.